Great. Uh, Mercedes uh, made a great presentation about modern identity management like two uh, sessions ago. And uh, maybe you heard her that there are more than 20 good practices, uh, considerations, and rules to take into account when you want to implement uh, modern identity management. Uh, well, in this last session of the present of J Prime, I will talk about how not to implement any of these rules, <laughs> uh, but still deliver to your customers uh, really the authentication system that uh, they want to have. But first things first. Uh, five years ago, I was uh, working in a startup-like company, and uh, we been approached by a potential customer who really liked the solution, the service that we were providing, but they had a very strange but very strong uh, requirement. And their requirement was related to password change policy. They wanted to um, align it, uh, if I can say it like this, uh, with the synodic month, not the standard, but synodic month, uh, or said in another way, they wanted to have the password changed every three full moons. That's why you see the moon there. <laughs> I bet uh, you all have uh, this at least one customer that uh, keeps you uh, yeah, busy with this kind of uh, strange and irrelevant requests. Well, does it, strange, uh, does, does it uh, sound irrelevant uh, to use uh, moon faces? Definitely it is, but is it uh, uh, unreasonable? Uh, a wise man once told me, start with why. Uh, always try to understand what a client really wants, uh, and then uh, you will be able to provide the clients the best solution for them. So. Uh, after a couple of discussions, it appeared that uh, they had their reasons from security point of view. They wanted not to have uh, uh, even intervals for changing, uh, for resetting the passwords. Uh, and also from legacy point of view, they uh, actually had a system that implemented this uh, uh, synodic algorithm. And uh, the users uh, that they have uh, already get used to this. So we really wanted to have this customer, and uh, the next logical question was how we are going to uh, implement this. Uh, the authentication and authorization component is uh, something that you usually uh, design, implement, test, uh, and deploy once, uh, and then you are using it. You, it's working, so you do not change it unless, of course, uh, this kind of strange requirements come. Uh, at that point, uh, we had several options, and to be honest, I uh, evaluated uh, uh, a single sign-on approach, but at that time, it was, yeah, quite frightening <laughs> to jump into the SSO. Uh, it was too complex, and it would have been too expensive, actually, uh, in terms of resources and implementation integration. So our team just uh, patched the uh, uh, legacy, if I may say, uh, authentication component. And by legacy, I mean it was not that old, but uh, we lacked uh, any tests. So uh, uh, by definition of legacy, it is legacy. And uh, we patched this uh, component with the specific logic for this particular customer. We got the deal. Uh, I just guess that this ugly patch is still in the code base and uh, yeah, nobody's using it anymore, but who knows. Uh, now back to the present. Uh, a couple of months ago, uh, an enterprise customer at Limplum uh, came with a really long uh, list of uh, requirements about uh, password policies like uh, history, expiration policy, um, requirements what a password should be, uh, uh, like uh, diff uh, supporting different uh, uh, 
multi-factor authentication uh, mechanisms. And uh, they were a big customer of ours and said, yeah, we expect that you adjust uh, your uh, um, password policies to meet our uh, security requirements. Their main concern was that uh, our uh, current security poli uh, password policies were not uh, uh, not adhering to the industry standards and they wanted to have uh, control on this. Again, uh, starting with why. Uh, like in the previous case, the customer has the system that implements exactly these uh, uh, password policies and security requisitions they wanted to have. Uh, further on, their users uh, use one and the same identity to, uh, to access all the different internal services of the customer. Uh, in other words, the customer already had uh, a single sign-on solution uh, in-house, and uh, they were quite happy with the overall security and the control they have at the moment, and just using Cleanplum was actually jeopardizing this level of security they had. Also, uh, their users were really happy to have one identity for all and not to create uh, separate accounts in Cleanplum. Well, so far so good, but uh, now how we are going to react in this case? Uh, the the answer to the how question this time was quite easy because we, well, we just cannot meet all the requirements in a reasonable time. Uh, further on, uh, our authentication and authorization subsystem is uh, legacy in terms of uh, um, age, testability, architecture, even uh, implemented in a technology that we actually do not want to support anymore. Uh, so, uh, uh, it would have been very expensive to do all of these uh, uh, requirements in the legacy system. Instead, uh, we explored, instead of actually mimicking all the functionalities in our system, uh, we explored the idea to use the existing SSO solution of the customer, because there were other services using it, and just adapt a uh, Limplum service uh, to nicely talk to the um, SSO solution that they have. The benefits of such uh, solution are quite obvious. First, the customer uh, has the full control and uh, can change and implement whatever security uh, aspects of uh, the, the identity management uh, they want to have. And the users also continue to have uh, just one identity to use with, uh, with all of the uh, systems. Uh, also, from point of, uh, from Limplum point of view, adhering to well-established uh, standards like uh, SSO uh, creates a new selling point, so uh, it was a win-win situation in this case. But before we go into technical details, uh, I will now uh, tell you shortly how the federated identity actually works. Um, so we have these three uh, entities, the user, the service provider, and the identity provider. So when, the, when we have a federated identity management, uh, uh, when the user tries to access the service, uh, or the service provider, uh, the user's credentials are not requested by the service provider, but the service provider uh, trusts the identity provider to properly and uh, uh, yeah to properly uh, identify the user. Um, also, uh, the whole identity of the users of all users stays at the home of the uh, customer at their premises in the so-called identity provider. Uh, so. Uh, in this uh, scenario, the user never gives any permissions to the services, but he is uh, sent to the identity provider, identifies there, and uh, uh, because there is a 
establish trust relationship between the identity provider and the service provider, uh, then the service provider accepts this uh, uh, identity uh, as valid. Uh, there are different protocols, uh, some of them widely used, some of them quite exotic. Uh, the, the two most important and widely adopted protocols are SAML uh, with the latest version and uh, OpenID Connect, which actually uh, uh, sits on top of O out. Uh, the latest version of SAML uh, uh, is widely adopted, although it's quite old, is widely adopted by enterprises, uh, banks, big organizations, uh, health uh, uh, institutions, uh, insurances, and so on. Uh, that's why our uh, solution, if I may say so, uh, is uh, based on uh, this uh, protocol. Also, uh, the, the market... Uh, leaders in the identity as a service or otherwise called uh, um, directory as a service uh, uh, solutions like uh, Okta, um, Jump Cloud, uh, G Suite, uh, name it, they support uh, uh, this protocol. Uh, now, let's see how uh, the, the three actors actually uh, play together. Of course, first the user wants to access uh, the service. Oops, uh, pointer, pointer. Okay, the user wants to access the service, but there's no session at the moment. So the service provider generates and sends a SAML login request to the user browser or agent, which is then uh, redirected to the identity provider. The identity provider does uh, his magic. Uh, they can ask for a, a multi-factor authentication, retina scan, DNA, as Mercedes said, whatever they want to have, and they have. And when, once the identity is confirmed by the identity provider, uh, it uh, generates an encoded SAML response, which is sent back to the user agent, which is forwarded to the uh, service provider. And then the service provider needs to uh, verify the response, uh, how this verification is done. As you remember, I told you about this uh, trust uh, uh, relationship between the identity provider and the uh, uh, service provider. The uh, ident identity provider uh, uses uh, uh, its uh, private key to sign the uh, SAML response and also uses the public uh, certificate of the uh, service provider. So when the response comes to the service provider, the service provider uses the other combination, uh, the public key of the identity provider to verify the signature and its private key to decrypt the message. Uh, then uh, when this uh, verification uh, is done, we are able to extract from the SAML response uh, the identity of the uh, user, set up a session, and grant access. So this is basically how it works. So how, having in mind uh, uh, how the SAML authentication workflow uh, actually happens, uh, let's see how we are going to change the authentication subsystem that we have. Obviously, login and logout uh, routines must be changed because, uh, well, now they have to speak SAML. Uh, also, the SAML protocol requires one mandatory endpoint to be present at the service provider, and this is the ACS. It stands for Assertion Consumer Service. This is actually when this step number six happens. As I said, after verification of the uh, response, identity uh, is uh, fetched from there together with some additional session information. The identity provider maintains a session for the locked in users on their end, and they are also maintaining uh, session expiration. So uh, together with the, the identity, 
we receive also when this session is about to expire. Um, uh, so that we can uh, invalidate it on our site as well. Um, the logout endpoint, uh, the new one, uh, actually enables uh, the so-called identity provider uh, logout uh, flow or single logout. We have single login, uh, sign-on, and single logout. Uh, basically, this is uh, um, this covers the following scenario: a session is terminated on the identity provider. For example, uh, an employee is fired, so uh, its account is gone. Session is terminated. So, uh, having this uh, logout endpoints according to the SAML protocol. The identity provider informs all available services that this session is no longer valid, and uh, it's the responsibility of the service provider to terminate the session as well. The last, it, it's an optional uh, endpoint, is the metadata. It's kind of a SAML description of the, uh, all the previous uh, endpoints, uh, uh, public certificate of the service provider, and so on. The identity provider also uh, has this kind of uh, metadata. So exchanging the metadata uh, between the service provider and the identity provider establishes this uh, uh, trusted relationship, basically. Um, well, <laughs> that's fine, but uh, you remember that uh, the component uh, in uh, Limplum that is uh, responsible for logging, logout, session management, and so on. Uh, we did not, do not want to further develop and maintain it. Also, uh, if we have to add new libraries, we have to write a lot of more tests in a technology that uh, we do not want to develop. That's why we take another approach. Uh, actually, all of the uh, SAML-related functionalities are externalized to a new service, like you can think of it as a microservice. It actually adheres quite well to the uh, architecture. Uh, and also the whole uh, login experience, including the uh, UI uh, stuff, is moved here into this new component. Um, so when the user wants to log in, he's forwarded here. He enters uh, some kind of... Uh, email, for example, and uh, then we are able to determine which of the available identity providers uh, we would like to go and, uh, and uh, use for uh, identification of this user. When the uh, user is identified by the identity provider, we receive the uh, ACS response and uh, store all the session information in a local database, and also wrap the uh, user identity uh, with, and some additional attributes in a, as, a, as claims in a JSON web token and send it back to uh, the Limplum application. So this is the first part where we had to touch uh, the uh, Limplum application, uh, but uh, the, the change is actually uh, not more than uh, 10 uh, lines of code in Python. Uh, our service provider, uh, although not mandatory, implements also the uh, uh, single logout protocol. That's why uh, it is important that when a logout response comes here, we uh, must invalidate the session. But uh, because the session is stored here and the uh, Limplum application does not know anything about it, it pulls from time to time, like in an interval of 30 seconds, whether the uh, session is valid or not. These 30 seconds, of course, can be configured. Uh, last but not least, actually, uh, the service provider uh, can support multiple identity providers. Usually, if, when you uh, look at the uh, relationship between service provider and identity provider from the identity provider point of view, it's many to one. Uh, 
many services are, are handled by one identity provider. In our case, we have uh, a lot of customers which has this functionality enabled, but of course they have different identity providers. So our service provider is uh, able to make a distinction uh, between and handle multiple uh, uh, identity providers. How is this uh, actually done? Uh, instead of having a plain uh, ACS endpoint, we append at uh, the end of the endpoint a unique identifier of each of the uh, identity providers. So, uh, as you remember, the ACS endpoint is part of the uh, service provider description. So, the identity provider knows which endpoint to call. So we can uh, get this uh, additional uh, param parameter that is the uh, identifier of the identity provider, load uh, its metadata, like the public certificate, and uh, verify the response. It's uh, easier to uh, implement it than to uh, talk about it <laughs> in details. And uh, then a few words about uh, the technologies that we use to uh, implement the identity provider, uh, the service provider, sorry. Uh, well, it's quite modern and uh, very nice. Uh, fits into the Java ecosystem to uh, use uh, Spring Boot, Spring Security, REST template. So we, uh, yeah, just the Spring magic works. Uh, Working with SAML, however, uh, it's not that easy because uh, all these requests and response are very ugly XML fragments. And uh, we, we found this uh, one login uh, third party library which implements a kind of abstraction on top of the XMLs and you can easily uh, work in an object oriented way with this. Actually, Okta which is a market leader in this field, is also using uh, one login library, so I believe this is a wise choice. <laughs> uh, the rest of the components, uh, Postgres, we use for storing the active sessions uh, that we have currently, uh, also the identity provider configurations. Uh, uh, we have a very thin caching layer uh, based on Redis, uh, uh, which caches what we store in the database, actually, so that we do not hit it with every request. Uh, these are active sessions and the uh, identity provider configurations. And uh, finally, uh, we deploy the whole uh, thing as a, we build it as a Java container and deploy it in Kubernetes. Uh, there are two main uh, reasons to do this. First is, uh, uh, horizontal scalability, it comes almost out of the box there because, uh, yeah, although this component uh, is not heavily loaded, imagine how many requests do you send uh, for login per day. Not that much uh, compared to all of the other. Uh, but also, uh, deploying this in Kubernetes uh, uh, allows us to have a high availability of this component, uh, which is a lot more important uh, to be always sure that the users are able to log in and access your services. Um, so, what can I say? <laughs> uh, single sign-on is not that frightening anymore, isn't it? And also not that complicated. For me, and I, I hope also for you, it sounds more human now. And uh, back to the opening of the presentation, do yourself a favor and uh, outsource the whole identity manager to your customers. They know it better how to do it what they want. Uh, just by extending uh, your new or uh, legacy components with uh, uh, single sign-on technology by implementing the service provider uh, interface. Well, that's it. Thank you. <laughs> Quite sure. <laughs> <laughs>
questions? I'm here. Uh, Yes. Well, uh, the current architecture of the service provider can uh, implement uh, another set of endpoints, for example, for Open Connect, uh, Open ID Connect. Uh, we also uh, evaluated whether it is feasible to base the, this implementation on uh, Key Cloak, for example. But uh, yeah, working with legacy code in Python and doing the integration there was quite uh, overcomplicated. And also, currently, we are uh, working on a user interface so that our clients from the legacy uh, application can configure uh, their identity providers without our help. So uh, integration with Keycloak was not uh, the best solution in our case. But if you are starting uh, a new project with, uh, which needs uh, this kind of functionality, like single sign-on, uh, I would strongly suggest to use Keycloak because it's a great tool, uh, uh, product. Well, uh, setting up uh, Redis uh, to be persistent in Kubernetes uh, is a little bit more complicated. Uh, and also, uh, we were not quite sure whether we will need caching or not, so Redis was added a little bit after the, uh, we had the implementation uh, with the Postgres. Uh, bec uh, anyway, with Spring Data, you have this uh, abstraction layer, so you can easily replace the underlying data store. So Maybe we will consider uh, having really uh, persistent Redis with uh, not expiring keys. And uh, yeah. we are using Redis mainly for cache and not as a database at the moment. Well, uh, in our case, I think uh, it is not like this because uh, um, when you set up the identity provider to speak with our service provider, for example, in Octo or G Suite, every identity provider as a service, uh, you have a small icon saying, okay, go to Linplum, and users can go directly. In order not to allow all of the users from this external organization to have access to Limplum, but only the controlled group that the customer wants, they also have uh, their uh, identity or accounts in Limplum, but like passwords, they cannot use it anyway. So when we receive the ACS response, uh, we find out this account and create the session for, for it for the Limplum account. Also. Uh, in uh, the Limp, in, in Limplum, we have uh, their uh, ACLs, what they can do in the scope of the uh, uh, Limplum project. Uh, and uh, this is also something that uh, I think is a good practice, uh, not to overcomplicate the uh, SAML response, because it is possible that uh, you have also role mappings uh, between uh, identity provider and service provider. You can have user provisioning as well. But uh, these are things that uh, we consider now as a post uh, uh, GA, how do I say so? Well, and then thank you. Have a nice uh, day and uh, hope to see you next year. <laughs>